Good afternoon. Uh, we are going to have our uh, second uh, Joe Pelosi webinar this week, um, and uh, he, he did such a job that uh, we're going to be having him back again Friday here, and uh, he's our content marketing expert, and he's still in the midst of his 22-city tour teaching people about all of this stuff, so I would definitely encourage everyone to, to uh, attention because we've learned a ton from him already, and uh, we're, we're learning more and more each time we hear him speak. Today he's talking about marketing for publishers, leverage, leveraging social media, and he's going to give us five social media steps that will rock our world. So I will let take it from here, Joe, and uh, we'll be looking forward to it. All right, Dave. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Really excited about uh, getting into this today. So we'll do a little bit of intro, and then we'll talk <clears throat> Excuse me, about what we're going to go through today in the webinar. Uh, if any of you are active on Twitter, and if you're not, maybe you will after we get done with today's session. Uh, my handle is at Junta Joe. And as Dave was saying, I speak all around the country, do workshops and keynotes about content marketing. Spent a lot of time in Europe last year as well talking about content marketing. And content marketing is basically how brands are becoming their own publishers. And when I'm talking to publishers like I am today, we talk about the opportunities to use some of these methods that brands are using, actually. Uh, to, to grow our businesses and look for revenue opportunities. Uh, some of the things I'd like, like to call to your attention, I uh, wrote the book uh, with Newt Barrett called Get Content, Get Customers. It's sort of a how-to manual for content marketing, so if you're interested in the content marketing field, check it out. And then things we launch in content marketing, one is the Content Marketing Institute, which is education and training all around content marketing. And Junta42 is like the eHarmony for content marketing, where we match up brands looking to do content projects, such as custom magazines, newsletters, webcasts, uh, social media, whatever the case might be, with uh, experts that offer those services, uh, that so specifically and historically known as custom publishers. And then I'll talk about Social Track a little bit later in some of the idea sessions. And then we just launched in beta something called Tail Foundry. So what Tail Foundry is, it's a private label content marketing solution. So if you're looking to get into the marketing services area, but you're not really sure how to execute, uh, we can help you at Tail Foundry. So we execute a lot of those marketing services projects on your behalf for your customers. All right, so that's enough about me. Let's get into this whole thing. So really, preface when we're talking about social media marketing, there are of internal reasons to use social media from an internal um, communication uh, morale turnover standpoint, but really what we're talking about today is attraction and retention. So how are we going to attract more readers, more uh, attendees, more subscribers by leveraging the, these different social media channels as part of, of our overall marketing program? So a couple of warnings to throw out there. I, I like to put these out there because a lot of people think that social media is free or they don't get it or shouldn't use it. So let's talk about a couple of things right off the bat. First, it's not easy. Um, just because you get a Twitter account and a Facebook account and you have your Facebook fan page with your magazine brand and, and all that good stuff, it's very, very challenging to actually get the most out of your social media campaign. So we're going to talk about how to do a little bit of that today. If you really, really want it to work for you and your employees, we really need to let go of all our control issues. Uh, really, we never had control at all. We just thought we did. Well, now we know for sure that we don't because we see it happening right in front of us. And we'll talk about some of those tools and how that's happening today. Uh, it's not cheap. Uh, social media is not cheap. It's just a different kind of expense. It takes resources to get this stuff done. So what I'm going to talk about today, some of this is going to be very, very beginner type stuff, and some of it's going to be very advanced stuff. I think you'll get at least one or two really good things to chew on and take forward, but you got to remember that doing this takes some kind of resources. You're going to have to have somebody dedicated to doing this to get this done, and that means they're going to have to hire or you're going to have to probably use somebody within your current structure and have them stop doing something else. So obviously we just can't add on, oh, we like to, <laughs> we can't just add on forever to what people are already doing. But and I've seen it happen with a lot of comp a lot of publishers. If you do this right, this will work. Um, so give it some thought on this a little bit, and uh, we should have some fun today going over this. And then I know at the end, David, you're going to throw out some questions, and we'll do a little Q&A session. So this, this presentation here lasts about a half hour, and then we'll do a Q&A for as long as we can. So first talk about the five steps, as David put it, social media, steps that are going to rock your world. Um, I think that 
uh, these are good ideas. You don't have to do all five, but if you do, boy, I think there's a huge opportunity. They're just not easy to do, but they're definitely possible, especially if you are a leader in your brand niche. And then after that, we'll go through those five points, and then I've got a, a bunch of different ideas that revolve around social media and online marketing that you can take and steal and use for yourself. To use this graph whenever I start a social media segment, and this uh, quote is from uh, Avinash Kaushik, who is the analytics evangelist over at um, Google. And what he says, social media is like teen sex. Everyone wants to do it. Nobody knows how. When it's finally done, they're surprised it's not better. I mean, it's so. When I talk to publishers, they're like, "Hey, I'm doing social media, and you know, I was really hoping for more, but I'm not really sure what I'm getting out of it." And it's almost to a T. So when I saw this, I'm like, "Oh my gosh, this is just so true on how publishers approach this." All it's important to realize is publishers. We we always focus. We're very very tactical for some reason. We always focus on oh, it's our magazine or our e-newsletter or our events, very, very tactic-oriented. And when it comes to social media, they think, okay, well, it's Twitter, it's um, it's Facebook, it's some other tool. Well, yeah, the tools are important, but the tools come and go. It's sort of the how and the process. And I think that's where I want to focus on today is the strategy behind this. And we'll talk about tactics, but don't get me wrong, but I want to focus on the strategy first, and that's really what the five steps are about we're going to be talking about today. Your ultimate goal as a publisher should be a trusted expert resource in your niche wherever your customers are at. That could be online, um, in, a, in event format, in person, in print. Most of us have print publications. So we've got to figure out, okay, we need a trusted expert resource everywhere. That's what it means to be a niche publisher. That's what it means to be a publisher in our markets. It's very tough to do that today because you have a lot, a lot of different publishers, non-publishers, semi-pros, that are out there publishing. So we need we need to make some decisions right now to figure out, okay, how do we really become the trusted expert resource online? So so we're going to be talking about that. I also like about it this way when it comes to creating your social media footprint. Um, Dan McCarthy, who's the CEO of uh, NCI Communications, I'll actually use an example from his in a few few minutes. But he talks about the idea of creating the online an online footprint through social media. And I think it's really important if you look at this from an asset standpoint. We're trying to create an asset with our social media. So think about it in the number of tickets you have. So the more tickets you have, the more opportunity you are to have a larger footprint online. Let me go into a little bit more detail on that. If you think about the more content that you create in more different types of ways, depending on who your readers are, who your users are, then the more connections you make online in those social media channels that we're talking about, like a Twitter, like a Facebook, like a niche online community, you create a more powerful online footprint. So wherever your readers are at, you're sort of widening the net to not only find the readers that you may not have a chance to find right now, but you're also going out there and reaching your current readers in more and different ways. And that's what we want to do. So we create more revenue opportunities for us in the process because they keep coming back to us. So you think about if the more we do that, the more tickets we have. So if we do very little and we have a few pieces of content on our site, or let's just say we have a digital replica of our magazine, we put it online, maybe we have a couple online articles, we share them maybe a little bit, we've got a Facebook page, Twitter account, you know, we got a couple tickets. But if we are blogging every day, we've got our editors blogging, our employees blogging, uh, we've got multiple Facebook uh, pages, we've got multiple connections in LinkedIn and on Twitter, and all that, all that work together in harmony, we've got lots of tickets. We've got lots of ways for people to find us, to come back to our website, to engage with us online, to go to our events, to sign up for our newsletters. Uh, we actually just did some recent research with marketing profs. We're trying to figure out the difference between what makes people effective in social media and content marketing and what makes people not effective. And what really we found out was the ones that thought they were effective at content marketing versus not effective, they were just doing more blogging, more sharing on Facebook, more commenting. They had their employees more involved. They were doing more of all these things we're going to be talking about today. So if you're not effective at social media and content marketing, it might be because we're not doing some of these things we're going to talk about today become the magnet. So what we're going to do, we're going to leverage these social media channels so that we can get them to come back to us in some way to do something, to sign up for something, to be more active in the communities. And I, don't, I want you to 
to, to remember that this is a very much a search play. Um, social media sites, lots of different links going a lot of different places, and are also um, very friendly. So, exa for example, if you upload an article to LinkedIn or upload an article to SlideShare, we'll talk about SlideShare a little bit later, um, which is YouTube for PowerPoints, are um, search themselves, but they're also found in search by Google and Bing as well. So the idea is the more content that you get out there off-site that you but directs back to your site, it's going to help you get found more in search engines. So just don't forget about the whole idea of search, which is very important when it comes to social media. Uh, that from that marketing process, Jump to 42, ABM, and BMA study we talked about, we asked uh, marketers and publishers what social media sites do they distribute content. Here's the main four. And for the most part, I think these are where we're going to commit some of our most of our attention, but I'm going to talk a little bit some other areas that you want to focus on as well. So Twitter, Facebook, their own blogging, and LinkedIn. So basically, there's your big four, and then YouTube is right below that as well. So your big five would be uh, these four plus YouTube. All right, let's get to the five steps. So the first step is find out where your customers are hanging out. And I need to preface this to talk about the publisher mentality. I've worked with hundreds of publishers. I grew up, uh, my publishing career was at Penton Media, which is a large business publisher. I ran uh, custom publishing there for quite a few years. And the whole publishing mentality is, well, we want people to just to come to our website. We just create this great content and they should just come to us. Like, why do we have to go out and get them? Well, in social media, it doesn't work like that. You actually have to go out to the people. So what we want to do first is we want to target the top blogs or websites in our niche. And by the way, these, some of these are competitive, and that's okay. But if we want this to work for us, we need to work with the system, not against the system. So target those top to five to ten, and you're saying, okay, well, how do I find them? Well, you go to places like Google Blog Search. Use a tool like it's a free tool like Google Alerts. So it's it, and Google Alerts into Google, and of course it'll, it'll come right up. And Google Alerts is you can put in um, different keywords and get notifications when people talk about certain things. So let's say that your niche is lean manufacturing. Well, you have lean manufacturing all set up in Google Alerts, so when somebody talks about lean manufacturing, you know where that's coming from. It's probably one of your top blogs, or at least a blog that you should have on your radar and figure out. Once you get and figure out, okay, well, here's the top 10, the top 15 influencers, what we need to do is read. We need to read and figure out what's going on and then start getting an active by commenting. The thing about social media that's really important, Chris Brogan, who's a social media expert, if there's a thing as a social media expert these days, uh, is 25-50-25. So the first 25% is listening, and this is what we're really talking about, is listening through social media to find out where we need to be. So 25% listening, 50% is commenting. Are you commenting on blogs? Are you getting active? Are you actually being human on these networks? Very important. And the last 25% is publishing. That's what we're really good at. We know how to publish. So publishers are really good at 25% of what the social media process should be. And we're not very good at 75% for the most part. I mean, listening, we do listening. We're editors. We're journalists. We understand listening, but not listening from an online standpoint. Your journalists are probably already getting pretty good at this, so you can take a, a tip from them when it comes to that. So there's thousands and thousands of social media sites to choose from. So where are your customers hanging out at, and how do you know? So you've got to – this is a good resources thing. We can't monitor uh, necessarily 50 websites, but we can monitor 15, 20, and we can break that up within the people that matter in our company to make sure that uh, we're reading and getting active in those areas. So you just got to pick your spots here. So find out where they're hanging out at. Use the tools like Google Blog Search, like Google Alerts. We're going to talk a little bit later about using a, a service called TweetDeck as part of Twitter to do this as well. But are, which groups are they active in? You, do you need listening to and then active in? Yahoo and LinkedIn Answers are two very important things. So if somebody's asking a question about lean manufacturing in LinkedIn Answers, they're, they're looking for some answers, and uh, – are the expert in lean manufacturing, you better be there on LinkedIn and answer that question. So there's an opportunity there, and there's a lot of people like John Jantz who, who wrote Duct Tape Marketing and wrote a new book called The Referral Engine. He grew his business just from the fact that he was very active on LinkedIn answers. And people started following him. He grew a business all around that, and now he's got a large publishing empire behind him. Groups, don't forget about Google. There's a lot of niche Google groups that we need to look into 
and see. So just go to Google Groups and start searching. Where are there niche online communities in your area that you need to be involved in? Now, of course, Twitter, Facebook, StumbleUpon, Business Week Exchange. You can go on and on and on. But find out where your customers are hanging out at. You probably have a good idea already. Do a little bit of additional research and start allocating some attention time to those areas. Okay, so let's say you've done step one, and you've got your list of 15, let's say 10 blogs and five other niche sites or 10 other niche sites and two LinkedIn groups. And you say, okay, well, here's where we need to spend some time. Great. You've got that done. You're starting to pay attention to those. You're starting to comment on those sites. Great. You're positioning yourself as an expert everywhere everywhere your customers are at. That's fantastic. So number two, here's where it gets a little bit of strategic. So step one's sort of easy, and a lot of you are doing some of that already. Step two is okay, well, let's work for the system, again, not against the system, right? So why don't we sign up these key bloggers to be contributors on our site? We've been doing this for years, right? We see it, there's an editor out there. We say, okay, you can be a contributing editor. You can be a part of our magazine. But a lot of us don't leverage this as much as we could. And I want you to look at a sample from Marketing Profs because they've done this, and they've been very successful at it. They have one of the most popular blogs out there in marketing called MP Daily Fix. And what Marketing Profs has done is they've gone out to the community and they found the experts in each area of marketing that they cover. And they say, would you like to come over and contribute to our site? And basically, MP Daily Fix is a, a network of bloggers that, that can create original content, mostly original. Sometimes it's repurposed, but mostly original content as part of their blog. And the great thing is, is then they share it with their community. So people like to say that they've been featured in marketing profs, and then they share it out to their Twitter networks and their Facebook fans. So what you're doing is you're leveraging your online footprint through people that have influence in their market. So very, very – so mark, that's why marketing profs has over 300,000 members now because they've gone out – to the influencers and sign them up and said, hey, would you be part of our community? And they'd say, yes, absolutely, would love to. So think about that as your number two there. I also, also like the, the look at this. I think this is funny every time I look at it. Think like AOL. A lot of people said AOL was going down the tubes years ago, and I actually thought they were too. If you look at what AOL's done from a strategic partnership standpoint, we could learn a lot from what they've done. So over the years, they've been purchasing and partnering with these little niche online communities and setting them up as part of their network. So two in the AOL tech area, one was in Gadget, the big Gadget site, the other one is Switched. The number, they've got, a, they've got a bunch of other sites that they have as well. But what they've done is they have all these little niche communities signed up under AOL. That's really, if you're looking at what makes AOL so powerful right now, it's all these niche communities. Well, shoot, that's what you have. You have a niche community around some type of topic. You can be doing the same thing as AOL. So we're in our first example, we were just talking about, well, you know, why don't, just sign them up and get them to, you know, write for your blog and whatnot. That's fine. But maybe you go to some of these and say, you know what, we'd like to strengthen this partnership a little bit, um, get into a conversation with them. There's no, like, uh, I think we had a question last time was, talking about how do we go forward and set up a relationship with them. There's no, like, really, really good hard and fast rules to do this. Basically, it's getting in a conversation with all these semi-pros that are out there and figure out if you can have a relationship with them on some basis. Sometimes it might just be you promote them, they promote you in kind. Uh, there's a content sharing portion of it, or you could just get down to a point where say, okay, we'll value your website at the number of subscribers you have. You know, here it is, and, and you know, or how much revenue you're coming in, and you could actually buy them. So just the idea of thinking about how you could partner with some of these communities that are already created, uh, that you can create an, an asset and, and grow your online footprint for you. Now, I don't ex now, number three is changing your content process. Now, I don't expect you to uh, squint at this and read it because it's very small, but it, you'll, you'll get the gist when I go through this. And this is from Dan McCarthy, uh, president and CEO of NCI Communications, and he also writes on the blog Viral Housing Fix. So if you go to viralhousingfix.com, uh, you can see this chart that they have. Basically, it talks about the change of the content process for editors and how you can integrate this with social media and sort of make social media magic and grow that online footprint. So let's kind of go from the left to the right. So if you look on the left side, it's basically how we used to do editorial. We used to get side up the Q&A. We used to get all our material. The editorial process goes out. We have an article. We write the article. It goes into the magazine. The magazine shipped out. Right? So basically, the end product for your content was a piece of content. 
And then we started to get a little bit savvy and say, oh, we've got all these other syndication channels. So we used to do the same thing, set up the story, got the, the guy or gal does their interviews. Still the end product is an article, but then we take that article, we also put it online, we put it in the magazine, we put it in the e-newsletter, we put it in the digital replica. And honestly, most, pub most of the publishers I talk to still do that model. It's just that we're getting better at syndication, not necessarily at content creation. Number three is a complete change in the way we develop content as journalists and editors. So let's kind of go through the way that would work, and we'll use the same situation. I have a Q&A with the CEO of one of the largest lean manufacturing companies, and I want to do a Q&A for the magazine. So the, act, the end output is, let's say, an article for the magazine. But I'm a journalist. My process changes. I need to create content all the time. What do I do? Well, I'm not going to necessarily change my process. I'm going to start recording it. I'm really changing the things that I'm doing already, but I'm not really taking advantage of actually publishing it. So what does that mean? All right, that means that I'm driving out to to do the Q&A in person, and I tweet on that, say, oh, going out to meet, uh, have an interview with at Lean CEO. All right, so we're engaging our uh, our um, our audience that way and letting them know, oh, great, we got a Q&A coming up. Oh, we get to the interview there, and we're not only taking notes of the Q&A, we are recording it so we can create a podcast of that so people can listen to that. And then we're all, maybe we've got our flip cam there, or we maybe we've got a, a video journalist there that's taking um, some video of that so we can take clips of that and end up putting those on YouTube or on our blog site in little snips. Well, I'm not writing the Q&A yet because I still have some other people to follow up with. So at the same time, I'm going to do a blog post and just talk about some key points of the things we're going to cover in the article or maybe uh, some side comments that was, were made with the, the CEO. I mean, basically, just the things that the, the journalist already does, but we're recording it. We're capturing it. And so instead of one big piece of content that then we're going to syndicate 200 times, we're creating 11, 12, 15 pieces of content all along the way because we got to update the Facebook page as well. and Maybe you took a picture on site of the Q&A, and that picture is going to go on Flickr, which is then going to be promoted on your Facebook page. So it's just a little bit of a different way to engage your audience wherever they're at online because what your audience really wants to know, we don't think about this as publishers, but the, they want to look under the hood. They want to know how you get this information. They're infatuated with it. The more you can let them under the hood and see what's going on, I think the bigger opportunity you're going to have to grow your online footprint. Just think about it from, from that respect. And then you'll have all these great syndication channels like Twitter and Facebook and all these outputs that we're using, but we're just getting smarter about the content that we create. Number three, so a little bit different thinking there. So number three is, and this might be the toughest one. So if you're saying, Joe, this is too tough, I completely get it. It's hard, but boy, if you could get this going, it is fantastic, and it is really working for some brands out there, so I wanted to share it with you, with you as a publisher. So what if you set up blogs for all your employees on your platform? The thing you need to know about a platform is, like whatever, you, let's say that you're in Drupal, Joomla, um, WordPress, uh, ASP.NET, PHP, whatever your technology platform is, it really doesn't matter because you can use, uh, uh, you know, Word, let's say the WordPress is the, I, I love WordPress the best. Uh, let's say that you go ahead and use WordPress. You can set up all your employees on a WordPress blog. It doesn't cost that much to do. WordPress is a free open source software. You just need a developer to get this up and running. So technology, don't let technology be a barrier. It's not a barrier. You can get this done. So let's say that you wanted to do this. The first thing you want to do is, and we'll talk about the why in a second because it's very important, but let's say you're going to do this. second thing is you need to create a social media policy. Because you're going to be really worried that, oh, my gosh, they're going to share this out there, and what if we let them run free, and you know, what are they going to say? Set up some ground rules. So if you want to set the ground rules, go see IBM's. Just type into Google IBM social media policy. It'll pop right up. It's fantastic. It's kind of an open sharing culture about it. And if IBM can do it, anybody can do it. They're one of the biggest companies in the world. So look at it from, from that respect. I also like to mention this. A lot of people, publishers get scared about letting their – uh, get letting their employees blog. And when I say employees, I'm not talking just editors. I'm talking designers. I'm talking your marketing people. I'm talking everybody. Everybody's got something valuable to say. And but what, what the the issue is is they're like, oh, what if you know what are they going to say? What if they say something about our company? What if they give some competitive information out? Here's my take. Do you read all the emails that your employees send right now? 
Do you listen to all the phone calls when they're talking to customers? Well, if you can trust them with emails to customers and phone calls with customers, you can certainly trust them doing social media. But you just set up that social media policy to make sure that they know the ground rules. It's a basic employee guideline package. It's nothing out of the, you know, it's too, too out of the box. But set the ground rules. Everybody knows and your lawyers are happy with it. So what would we want to do this stuff? And your employees are your best marketing vehicles known to humankind, except we don't leverage them. We usually just leverage our editors. But what about your de designers have something incredibly uh, incredibly valuable to say about the process of working in your market and design? Well, how about your analytics person that talks about marketing and the marketing in that? Now, each of them target different kinds of people, and that's why we probably want it on different blogs. But they all have something valuable to say in creation of content. You're widening that net. But... You have to train them. So that comes to the third point. You can't just let them go out there and say, here you go, here's your Twitter account, here's your blog, go to town. You actually need to train them, and, the, and we'll, we'll talk about how you train them on the next point. So it's very important, and that's something that publishers forget a lot of. If you look at sales training, traditional sales training to me, when I go into publishers, it's like, what do you do for sales training? Well, we send them out on the road with our best rep, and they go off for a couple of weeks, and then they're trained. Well, that's not it's not the same for, for social media training. You actually need to have somebody train them, say, here's best practices, here's what you do, and here's who you come to if you have any questions. So we actually get back a lot of control if we put our employees as rock stars. I'll tell you what, this will help your turnover like you would not believe because if you can help your employees be rock stars on your platform and the content that they're creating is on your platform, you're creating the assets for you, but you're also making them look great. It's almost a win-win because if all that content's on your platform, you have a little bit more control than if they go ahead and they're starting their blogs on their own or on their own platform. And they're already doing that, by the way. So you probably have a lot of bloggers that are already doing that. Really good example to look at is Indium Corporation. So you can go to Indium Corporation, just go type it into Google, and um, they, uh, I think it's chemical manufacturing area, a uh, bunch of engineers. But what they've done is they've set each of their employees up with their own blogs and their own search engine keywords to focus on for their blogs and their own specific expertise area. So look at this and what they've done. They set their employees up as rock stars, but it's definitely helping the company. And Indium, the marketing person for Indium, has been all over the country on these panels talking about how fantastic it's been for their business. So if it's been fantastic for a brand's business, what can it do for a publisher's business? I think you can do the same or, if not more, impact for your business. Number five, the last point to make this whole thing work and to really come together would be assign that internal champion, especially when you're talking about the, the blogging. But you, what you need is somebody to be sort of your social media ambassador or a content officer or whatever you, you want. I mean, let's say it's external content officer, whatever the case is. Because when you set everybody up and open the social media environment up, you need somebody that's going to oversee some training, support, guide them, be the cheerleader, really rob them out. I mean, this, you need to make sure you, you find out who that is. So how do you do that? Who's blogging right now? You probably have a good idea of it, and if you don't, it's pretty darn easy to figure out. And all you have to do is start Googling the names of your employees into Google and find out who has a very robust social media presence. Uh, find out who has the blog, who's really doing really good on, on Twitter. Um, so figure that out, and then you'll see that maybe that's the person to give them an opportunity to kind of rise to the occasion and say, hey, we got a new role for you. What do you think? The other thing to think about, to going back to point four about the employees blogging, not everybody's going to want to do this. Not everybody's going to have time to do it. Uh, but if you get focused on the 10 to 20% that want to do it, that will be really psyched up about doing it, focus on them, show the results, the web traffic they're getting, the conversions they're getting on their page, and then we can go and say hey, to everybody else, here's what we're doing, who else wants to sign up to this thing. All right, so those are kind of, I'm happy to take questions at the end about any of the execution parts of that. Um, you've got companies like an NCI Communications actively doing this right now and extending their online footprint. And what's interesting about the whole idea of an online footprint, when I say that, it's like, okay, how many Twitter followers do we have? How many Facebook friends? The increase in web traffic, they're counting things. There's there's only so much value to that by the by itself, but when you look at it with the number of people that are signing up for your e-newsletter and other types of behavior, and you put that together in an online footprint, you can sell that. 
That's a package. You say, well, it's not just, okay, we have 20,000 people on our audited circulation list. You could say, well, we have you know, 15,000 people following us on Facebook and 10,000 people following us on Twitter. By the way, we get over 10% of our traffic from Twitter, and a lot of our conversions come from Twitter. So just to, to give you an idea about that. So here's some ideas you can use section. Let's go through some of these. And I wanted to focus on Twitter. We focused on Twitter um, last time as well, but uh, I got a lot of questions on Twitter. So if you're not using Twitter, I want to uh, show you some of the value, some of the things that you need to do, the do's and do nots. Um, first thing is, if you're me, if, if you haven't signed up for Twitter yet or just signed up and you're not haven't figured out quite how to use it, I, I thought Twitter was incredibly stupid <laughs> when it first came out. Like, who would want to use this? And now it's like one of my favorite tools of all time. Uh, but you have to, when you get involved, then you have to do a couple things, and I'm going to go through those tips for you. First of all, don't answer the question, what are you doing when it comes to Twitter? Nobody cares what you're doing. They only care about themselves. So you want to focus on sending out information that only your customers care about, right? You don't care. They don't care you got out of the shower, you just landed in Paris, whatever, unless it's relevant to your audience. So focus on who that audience is and just give them information that's going to be relevant to them. Democratic, very important for publishers because most publishers' Twitter feeds are all about their content. They'll like bust out automatic five posts every morning and say, here's the content from yesterday, bang, bang, bang. But they're engaging. They're just using it as another distribution channel, which is fine. And it's somewhat uh, full of people just want to work it that way. But if you really want to do our five steps, we've got to be democratic. That means mix in other people's content. Going back to Chris Brogan, Chris Brogan says, for every one of your own posts, you should promote somebody else 12 times. I don't know publishers that are doing that, but that's sort of a magic formula where you have to do, do 10, at least five posts about other people's content, and then you can slip in your own content. Now you're really getting the community involved. Now you're saying we want to be part of this community. We don't just want to take our megaphone and say how great we are. And one way to do that is to use a best practice like VIA. So VIA at whoever it is, VIA at Junta Joe, VIA at Laversick in this case on the bottom. So what we're going to do is we're going to listen, and we'll talk about listening in a second using TweetDeck. Listen online, and we're going to say, okay, here's the missing link in journalism from this Laversick. They're a really good article. We're going to um, retweet that, but instead of doing RT, which is usually retweet at Laversick, we're going to change that and put via at Laversuck at the end. And what that does is it tells Laversuck that listening to you, we really like what you've done, and they're going to pay more attention to you, and they might share more of your information. It's just like you share theirs, they'll share yours, and I'll tell you what, it works. So you can spread your online footprint by just simply being nice and just and spreading other people's really good content. It's also a great way back in number one to find out like who those influencers are. This is also a great way to do it by using Twitter. So we talk about listening. Listening is Twitter is is the the most important free uh, focus group you'll ever see. I mean, these are people that are talking about things that are important to your, your publishing brand all day long. So JetBlue and Comcast and H&R Block, specifically JetBlue and Comcast, they've completely changed um, the the or the way that they work in customer service because they're listening. And I can go on and on with stories over and over where JetBlue, corporate office, they listen to somebody saying they didn't get to sit with their daughter on a plane, and an hour later by the time they, the person got on the, on the plane, they were sitting next to their daughter because JetBlue was listening to somebody who was complaining on Twitter. You can do the same types of things, but you can use them for, for profitable reasons as well. This is very important. If you are on Twitter and you're using just Twitter.com or you're not on Twitter and you don't know how to do it yet, first thing, sign up to Twitter. Second thing, use a Twitter management system. There are, I would recommend one is TweetDeck, second one is TweetGrid, the third one is Hootsuite. Uh, TweetDeck is the one showing on the screen. That's my favorite one. I use it all, all the time listening. And so what you can do is you can track your people talking about you, your brand, your publishing brand, your editors, your keywords. In the middle here, it, it shows I'm uh, – searching for content marketing, and when I see that coming up, somebody talking about content marketing, I say, okay, well, do I do something about that? Do I need to read it? Do I need to afford it to an editor? Do I need to afford it to a salesperson? 
you know, what do I need to do with that information? So very, very important that we listen through Twitter and use that management system. And when you do this, then you'll say, okay, Twitter's not so stupid because when you see people talking about your customers, and I mean, this is just, they're, 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 when I go out to, I mean, you're talking about marketers for the most part. When I go out and talk to marketers, over 50% of all marketers are heavily using Twitter now. And it's getting more and more. So Twitter is almost a mainstay tool these days, whereas last year it was like 5%. So it's really grown on. Integrate your content that's so it's shareable on your site. And the circle here is a tool called TweetMeme. Uh, it's a little line of code that you can insert into all your pages. So the point is, is if you're going to buy into all the social media stuff, you need to make sure that you actually um, integrate these tools, these sharing tools, so people can share it on Twitter. So if your readers are, aren't on Twitter, that's fine. But if they are on Twitter, they can see this story and they can share it easily through something called Tweet Meme, and that's with the retweet button there. Five Twitter do nots. Of course, we said don't tweet about you, right? You understand what a direct message is. A direct message is a one-way communication um, that nobody else can hear but you. It's usually followed with, it, like in TweetDeck, you'll see a D in front of it. Don't mistake direct messages and public tweets. Make sure you're when, you know when you're talking one-on-one -on -one versus talking to everyone because everyone can see and search for your public tweets. Cryptic replies. If you're doing a reply, even though it's to some person, try to make it as valuable as possible. So instead of saying, thanks, for the mention, you could say, thanks for commenting on the, the uh, lean manufacturing article and then put a link to the article again there. So you give some more context. So it's the same for number four, instead of just putting that link there. Give some context because every time you give more context to what your, what your tweets are about, there's a chance that somebody will share that. And then auto direct messages. A lot of publishers use auto direct messages that when somebody follows them, an auto message goes to my email box. So if I followed you and you had auto direct, an email would go directly to my inbox, and I would it would say, "Hey, thanks for the follow. If you want to sign up for our e-newsletter, go here." That's completely spam. It's completely terrible best practice. And I used to do that, and I had it up for a week, and I had so many complaints, I shut it down. So it just comes off as very, very spammy, and you don't want to go that direction. So if you're going to do direct messages, make them personal. Don't do auto-direct messages. Let's talk about uh, Facebook. If you have any questions on Twitter, please uh, type them in, and, uh, and David can get to those uh, at the end of the presentation. So we got like uh, five minutes left, so let's go through a couple more. So Facebook, again, there's, there's this thing called Facebook plugins. And if you don't know where they're at, go to developers.facebook.com. And the most important one is this like button at the top that you see. Very, very important social plugin. We just started using it. It's very powerful. A lot of people share content that way. And then when you when somebody clicks on like, it goes to their news feed board. And somebody says, hey, so-and-so likes the article on, on Justin Bieber or whatever the case is. And then you've got the sharing button below. So again, the same thing with tweet meme. Give your readers the opportunity to share the content if you already aren't doing it. If you want to look at a best practice, too, this is Mashable. So go to Mashable.com, and Mashable, has a, they always are on the cutting edge with how they leverage these plug-in tools. So you can check out Mashable. Facebook site that really integrates some stuff well, go to Kodak. Kodak runs a lot of sweepstakes and contests. So if you're thinking about doing that, they use a tool called Wildfire. I don't know a lot about it, but I do know that they use that and leverage that tool for different sweepstakes and contests. And you also see that they're very, very active. They respond back. When somebody likes something, they respond, thanks for the like. They're very, very human when it comes to their Facebook page. Uh, blogs for a second. So we, we talked about the importance of blogs. Um, and why you should use them for employees. But basically, this is a survey by HubSpot. The more you blog, I mean, I'm very, very much for quality content. I think it needs to be quality, consistent content from both publishers and brands are so, so important. But not so much frequency, but frankly, HubSpot did a survey, and they found that the more somebody blogs, regardless of the content, really, of course, I'm hoping the content is relevant, but the more, more somebody blogs, the more business they get. So in your case, it would be the more readers or more paid subscriptions or whatever your ultimate conversion would be. Um, the, more, the more you blog, the more traffic you get on your website, and the more you blog, the more Twitter followers you, followers you get. So the more you blog, the more that everything happens in your social media program. So if you don't have a blog right now, and I was just at an event, and only about 15% of the publishers actually had blogs up and running. 
So it might be an opportunity in your market to be one of the first ones to take advantage of this. So blogging tips. Blogging is different than what we would go through normally with article writing. It's just better. It should, you're, not, you're not just repurposing an article here. We're looking at bullets and lists are awesome. Titles are just like your magazine covers. You know, the goal of a magazine cover is to get them to flip the, flip the cover, right, to open it up. Same thing with a title. And you have to understand what your keywords are at and what somebody might type in to Google to try to find this blog because search is very, very important when it comes to blogging and people finding you. Remember, we're talking about that net, our online footprint, and finding people that we're not finding right now. If you can shake with a little video, audio, you can embed links from a uh, place like YouTube, uh, Vimeo, this is another um, sharing site, link to other bloggers. Remember, we're, we're trying to share here. We're trying to get their attention. We don't just want to be talking to ourselves in here like we do with most articles. We want to link to other bloggers, link to other articles, and then look at conversion blogging. And this is what I think will pay if you're trying to get this to work in your organization because the more traffic you get, then you get them to come to something at the bottom or something within your post to get them to do something that's relevant. You got, you got to make it's relevant to your actual post, but HubSpot does a really good job of this because if you look at the bottom, you just read a story on, let's say, you know, the latest marketing research or whatever the case is, and then at the bottom it's a free download on 50 marketing charts and graphs. Click on it and they generate leads from that. Um, so this, that's what it's called conversion blogging. We're actually trying to get a name or get information from blogging. Blogging in a lot of cases is to develop that relationship, more engagement, have them come back to your site a lot. But we also like conversions as well. And if your conversions are a goal, this is a really good way to do it. I'll talk a little bit about LinkedIn. Very, very important. 60 million members. A um, couple to look at, look at there. Status updates in LinkedIn are very important. So when you get your employees started up, they can share content through their status updates. Uh, there's not that's probably the most important tool that I could share with you to say, how do you get people from LinkedIn to go to your site? Have them share relevant uh, content, helpful content on their status updates for LinkedIn. If, they're look, if you're looking to simultaneously share on Twitter and share on LinkedIn, use right there that number sign. It's called a hashtag in Twitter, hashtag IN. And when you, can, you can link this up with your Twitter account, and everybody can do this individually so that when you post something on Twitter and you do hashtag IN, it posts to your, to your LinkedIn account as well. Uh, let's see. Choose key groups. So very, very important. There's a lot of really cool groups out there. We talked about there being where our customers are at. We've got to find out where those groups are, assign employees to those, and then we want to share relevant content to those groups. Be active in those areas. So I'm just saying LinkedIn is one of those underused areas. There are some groups that are very robust and other groups that nothing happens. So there's an opportunity to go into those groups and really uh, present ourselves as the trusted expert. Same with LinkedIn Answers. So go to LinkedIn Answers, opportunity there, do some searches, have somebody be in charge of monitoring that. So if a question comes up, uh, something in your industry, we want to answer that. We will be an expert, right? Some fun ideas for you. I like for the way Folio does their newsletter at the bottom because they say, here's where we're at on social media, not just our site. Oh, we've got Folio. We've got our, our own community, Media Pro. We've got other communities like LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. Make sure you tell them you're involved. Um, it's a very easy thing to do, but a lot of newsletters are out there that don't do it. I talked about that before. SlideShare, again, is like the YouTube for PowerPoints. So anytime your editors, your president, does or your salespeople, they do any kind of a presentation, share it on your own custom SlideShare channel. And then you can also take this and embed this like you would a video into your blog posts or onto your article sites or whatever the case is. So this one, uh, this is a presentation I did with Christina Halverson at Brain Traffic. We did this back in February of 2009, and I've gotten a, a number of direct uh, business contacts and actually driven business because they saw this presentation on SlideShare. So you can get direct business. So in your case, what is it? Is it a paid subscription? Is it uh, is it e-newsletter sign up? Is it uh, more traffic to your website? Whatever the goals are, SlideShare might be something that you want to look into that would help you. Um, think about the idea of multiple Twitter accounts. Uh, you might have a brand account for targeting your readers, and you might want a brand account for targeting your your advertisers. 
because you're talking about different things, right? So just remember, like, who are you trying to target with that? If you're targeting different people, you might want to consider a different one. So whereas, uh, let's say, you know, Genta Joe, I'm targeting uh, and marketing publishers, Genta 42, I might just be targeting just on the marketing side. I might have a separate one to target just publishers. So you got to think about whether or not you need separate Twitter accounts or not, depending on what your messaging is. Think of something remarkable that's not content. Again, HubSpot created something called Website Grader. Uh, that haven't gone to Website Grader, just a very helpful tool. Type in your URL, and they'll tell you some of the things you're doing well, like you're tagging your metadata, your Google page rank, um, you're sharing on social media. Those will tell you what you're doing good and bad. Uh, but it's a completely free tool, and this is one of their greatest lead gen efforts ever. So is there some content that you could tap into, some free content, maybe some content you ha you have as well, that people could then share around? Because they, they, people are website grader all over the place in social media. They've got millions of people sign up for this, and it's a free tool. It didn't cost them a heck of a lot of money to put it together. So what if you did that? What would it do for your business? And then to just kind of finalize uh, some idea, revenue ideas with social media, uh, we thought about the idea of what about publishers that want to get revenue from their readers? Now, what do they do? So we said, well, you know what? We could create a blogging content social media service for readers. Um, by partnering with publishers, and that's exactly what we did. So I'll give you an example. So we started in the HVAC market, and we said, all right, well, these are HV the, the magazine goes to HVAC contractors, but contractors have, you know, it's a free magazine, trade publication, um, and the contractors also have content, their own content, social media needs, that they, they're trying to reach their customers. But HVACR Business Magazine didn't have anything to supply to them, and they didn't have any way to get reader revenue. So what we did was we went to HVACR Magazine, we partnered uh, with them, and we said, well, we'll offer a blogging, content blogging social media service where we basically give them eight to ten blogs per month. We set up their Facebook account, Twitter account. We do this for contractors and create content for the contractors to attract and retain their customers on a regional basis. So just an idea of things that you can use content in social media. You know, of course, we link it up through Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn and all that good stuff. So you could sell a content program, maybe get money from a different direction. If you're interested in, in that idea, by the way, just let me know. I'd be happy to talk more about it. Um, and then listening techniques of service. I talked to a, a publisher. That, and this is, by the way, just going to things like search.twitter.com. that You can go to to figure out who's talking on Twitter. You can leverage TweetDeck, Google Alerts. Um, this is sort of a hot together uh, reputation management sy system, unlike like a more robust Radian 6 that you'd have to pay a little bit more money for. What if you created a listening service for your customers? And I talked to a few months ago about this concept, and they fell in love with it. Because first of all, we said, well, what if you just started to listen to the conversation that were happening to your key customers? so that you knew what was going on social media, maybe before they did, because they weren't listening on social media. And the second thing is, what if you then said, we will offer a service for you to help you do this? And if you're saying, oh, nobody would actually do this, we actually found a site called U Diligence that basically does reputation management, doing the same types of services that you could be doing in your market. And what U Diligence does is a really interesting model, actually. They signed up a bunch of universities to monitor uh, athletes in those universities and what they're doing from a social media standpoint. Like, are they doing some really bad stuff in Twitter and Facebook and whatever the case is, they need to be like trained and helped out and educated. So this is a possible thing that you could do, but just take this and do it for your market. Uh, in this box, if you're looking to get more uh, ideas from your customers, from your readers, um, My Starbucks is a really good My Starbucks idea. They actually have a couple ideas that were generated. Um, that they're actually starting to implement now. And what I like about this, you can actually get something like this sponsored. So it could be a sponsored idea that you could put out. You could leverage social media, Twitter, and that you wanted feedback on some key issue in your industry and then reward people for suggesting something uh, as it comes down the pot. Uh, Airlines does a deal of the day special on Twitter. So as you grow out your Twitter followers, um, you can actually do a deal of the day, sub free subscription of the day, T-shirt of the day. I mean, you probably have a pretty strong brand, um, stronger than you probably realize depending on how big you are, and you 
your readers like to be involved with your brand. So figure out a way to get them involved, maybe in some kind of contest or special of the day. And this is the last uh, point, and this is just something FYI to know. If you're trying to figure out how to save your brand name or register your brand name on all these social media sites and figure out who's taken it and who hasn't, go to something called Name Check, C H K at the end for check, and you can make sure that you reserve your brand name across these multiple social media sites that you may not have done already. Last helpful resource that I can, and this is the last slide, by the way. Um, the last resource is the Content Marketing Playbook, and I show you this for two reasons. One, you could use something like this. It's an ebook where you put it on something like SlideShare. You share it openly in social media. Um, there's no like registration to it. It's it's strictly for social media mentionings to spread through social media. We created this Hanleywood Marketing sponsor that with us, so they they paid money so that we could do something like this. So it could be a revenue opportunity if you did an ebook like this. And an ebook is like a sexy white paper. You turn it hor you turn it horizontal instead of vertical. You share a lot of really good information. But if you want to know like 42 different ways to share content, um, go to Content Playbook. Dot com. This is completely free, no sign up, check it out. Uh, I think it's just a really valuable resource to figure out some things that you can do, not only from a custom marketing services standpoint, but just ideas that you could use with your own publication. All right, uh, David, I, I think uh, uh, we have probably like 10 minutes left for questions, but uh, if anybody has any questions specifically that we don't get to today, please feel free to email me at joe at uh, junt42.com. Right, yeah, we, uh, we have some questions here. Um, First one, can you talk more about partnerships with other bloggers and how it works and how to approach it in the best practice um, to share info? I think you did touch on that yeah, a little bit. Yeah, I touched on that a little bit, but just to go in there. Uh, and, and some of these questions are from last, last well, that's time. Okay. Well, yeah, we're, we're trying, trying, to, we're trying yeah. to figure that out. I think the first thing is to make sure you build a relationship with them first. Don't just contact them out of the blue. So make sure that you're commenting on their blogs, you're active. They who are, they know that you're not just trying to horn it on their territory, and actually have somebody on your staff or you form a relationship with them. And then there's no like set um, way to set up these partnerships depending on how you do it. Some of them could just be uh, where you're it's it's a, it's a joint you're doing something. It could be something where you actually want to buy them. It could mm -hmm. be some co-registration. There's all types of depending on what your goals are. But I would just say the first thing, David, would be to get a relationship with them first instead of saying, hey, we've been watching you from afar, which is what publishers usually do. Just start getting active first before you do anything. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see here. Uh, it's effective to try to communicate via Facebook statuses, Twitter, et cetera, on the same level as the audiences we're reaching, or should we assume the role of the teacher? For example, should we try to try and use the same language that our customers use if the demographic we're reaching out to is younger or older? No, I or, think that's, that's, a, that's a good question, David. I, I would I would give a couple pieces of advice. First of all, when you're talking in social networks like Facebook or Twitter, talk like a human. Don't ever talk down. Just talk like you would talk in normal conversation. That's the most effective. Um, if you're talking in packaged content, like if it's a white paper, there, and it's especially a scholarly white paper, of course we want to talk a certain way that we want to make it instructive or something like that. But in the social networks themselves, uh, you definitely want to talk at the same level as your customers. So, so my whole advice is what would, I, what would you do if you were just talking to somebody that's sitting across from you? That's how you want to communicate. All right. Uh, how effective is Instant Messenger? Some websites offer an on-call expert via Instant Messenger, AOL, Windows Live. Is this a good way of communication? You know, um, I, I don't have a lot of expertise in that. I don't use any instant messaging, uh, whether it's uh, customer service on call type type thing. Some of those have been successful. So you, but that's more of a customer service role, not really a social media component. But for social mm -hmm. media, I don't know if that's uh, if anybody's actually using that a lot. Um, I would just say figure out how you could use a diff services like a Twitter and Facebook that your customer or wherever your customers are already at and then do some research on I am but I'll I'll make sure I do some research as well because I haven't heard any of my social media buddies talk about I am when it comes to uh, social media engagement yeah, I, I don't think we found it to be the best either um, all right uh, let's see where should you blog websites WordPress um, yeah 
on your own website or using WordPress or what oh you yeah, you know I, I think it it depends on what your platform's at already. If your website's on WordPress already, then great, you're done. Uh, most of us that use like Drupal or, or there's a lot of publishers are going to Drupal or they have some other technology, older technology. The easiest thing to do is probably to create your blog in WordPress and use a subdomain. And when I say subdomain, that would be like blog.publisher.com is the way to do it. If you're already using Drupal, Joomla, or WordPress, you could do you know your website slash blog is the best way to do it. Those are the two best practices instead of doing it some other site or another name or another URL. Try to bring it as part of your URL, get the Google juice. And if you're looking for a platform, the easiest one is probably WordPress, uh, open source solution, free, and you just need somebody to uh, develop that. And there are a lot of really good WordPress programmers out there. All right, we got one final question here, uh, and then we'll call it a weekend. Let's see. Um, I think you said this already uh but uh, where uh, to find out, quote unquote, who is listening? Like, what are some good sources to to find that out? That would be applicable to individual publishers and such. You mean um, how how to listen or who is listening? Find out who who is listening. Like, uh, you know, like find out where you should be listening to or who's oh, listening. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I get you. Okay. So so the number one thing that I would probably use is. To Tweet deck, and we talked about that before. Okay. Put in your keywords there, and you can then figure out on whether it's your brand, your employees, your keywords that you can track those um, as you go. You can also go to search.twitter.com. Is the one important one to go to, so you can figure out what then uh, you know, who, like you want to type in uh, Bill Gates. Who's talked about Bill Gates in the last four days? Bang, mm -hmm. comes right up there. Um, then you can go to something like Google Alerts, which we talked about, which is a really good listening portal as well. Uh, and the other thing that I would use if you have the money, you could look at like formal reputation management systems. And like, I think the leading one is like a rep, uh, Radiant 6. There's also something out there called Fil FilterBox. So they sort of, what they'll do is they'll go monitor a bunch of different sites at one time so you don't have to do the individual sites. If you're small and you don't have a lot of budget, I'd look at the combination between Google Alerts uh, and and tweet Twitter and search doc, uh, search.twitter.com. I would focus on those. And if you have more of a budget and you are lighter on on resources, but you have some money to do this, I would look at something like a filter box or a Radiant Six or something that can monitor multiple sites at one time and really focus on your goals and sentiment. So those, those companies do sentiment analysis too. So they'll say, these are positive mentions about you, negative mentions, where do they come from, where you, you know, where the, is most of the traffic going at, where you're getting these sentiments at, is there certain forums, what cases. So that's more your, your top shelf service. Okay. I, thank you for that. Um, I do remember one last question uh, from last time was the frequency of the blogging, and you explained it really well. Uh, to touch on that again. Exactly. So uh, uh, of you and and or employees. So um, so let's say that we were going to create a a blog for the brand and there's multiple bloggers. So probably with editors. I need to pick something consistently. Most of the brands uh, publishers that I look at do like once a day. What if it's a group blog? Let's say they have five. Editors have, and each of those editors blog once a day, and they're blogging about something. Each of them has a different topic, but they're all targeting the same people. If you do the employee blog that we talked about, you've got to be careful because if you're having your graphic arts person blog, they're, you don't want that mixed up with your editorial strategy. That's a different goal altogether. Like if you look at Indium's blog, they've got different keywords set to different bloggers, and people can sign up to their RSS feeds individually. So they might want to only talk to the graphic artist. They don't want to hear from the editor, depending on who it is. So that standpoint, from now from a frequency of blogging, if it's um, like a, it's an individual person, I would say probably once a week is the minimum that you'd like to see. Uh, but I think that there's all kinds of different ways to skin a cat, but I would say that the best way that you'd want to do it is figure out what you can do the best with the resources you have and stay consistently at it. So if that's, like I've been doing my, we talked about this last time, Dave, I'm doing my blog for three years. I've, I've never done less than two times a week. Mm -hmm. So whatever that promise that you make to your readership about how much you're going to blog, you say, okay, I'm going to blog, you know, two and Thursdays, and here it is, and we're going to stay on this 
until we get feedback that we should do differently. Seth Godin, who's a popular blogger, he blogs every day, seven times, and sometimes multiple times a day, but every not a day goes by where he doesn't blog. And he's been doing that for, shoot, I think something like nine years, and he's grown an empire around it. So and do, you, do, you, do you do that at the beginning, like when you start doing it, say, hey, um, guys, just so you know, this is when I'm going to be blogging, or are you just the consistency itself will No, I think that. the consistency itself is working out. I mean, I don't, okay. I, don't, I mean, you can do an open welcome blog and you can say uh, yeah I'm going to be blogging on this but nobody ever reads that because yeah. the first blog you do nobody yeah, exactly that's what I was takes, thinking as I was it asking. takes months yeah. to get it takes probably about six months to get really good traction behind your blog sure yeah. sure okay well do you have anything else Joe no no that's it I just if we if we have any questions that people um, even are listening to the recorded one uh, they can always feel free to email me at uh, joe at gentle42.com very accessible or on twitter at gentle joe well, awesome. Thank you very much again. Uh, and just so you know, from Wednesday till today, our company has already uh, implemented two, <laughs> two, two of the things that we learned from you. So, really? Uh, and, and, yeah, already. So you have to wanna, send me a note on that because I want to know what yeah. those are. Yeah, we won't go into details because uh, I didn't do it, but uh, Steve <laughs> sitting here next to me did. He told me we already did two, and I was like fascinated we did it that quickly. But yeah, we 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 literally have implemented two two things that we've learned already, That's and awesome. and already got them in the works. So, That's anyways, we're doing. That's great. Yeah, yeah absolutely. If you can just get one thing every now and then, it's, it's always worth it. All right, well, thank you very much again, Joe. Uh, thank you, everybody, for attending, and uh, we'll be uh, getting the, the recording out to you so you can uh, rewatch it and uh, apply some of these things. Thanks. And uh, everyone have a nice weekend. Bye-bye.